is nice about the agreement is that we have Iran officially saying we will not develop a nuclear weapon. The agreement says nothing about ballistic missiles, I should add, which they are actively developing. And it does give us a limited, not perfect, way of uh, inspecting. In other words, if, if there's, how do I put this? If there's, a, if there's a building that's being used to hold fissionable material, it sends off a heat signal, and you can pick it up from a satellite. And so Western IEA Atomic Energy Agency experts can say, uh, we're getting a really weird signal out of this building. We want to see it. It might take a week or two, but they'll get to see it under the agreement. Now, maybe that heat source suddenly disappears, <laughs> but it's a lot harder for Iran to develop a nuclear weapon under this agreement. It really handcuffs them. If we don't have an agreement, we don't have that mechanism. We don't have, so it's imperfect, but do we right now want to have to deal with a nuclear armed Iran on top of a nuclear armed North Korea? Well, and as an offshoot of that, haven't we allowed Iran to um, yeah, we transact business and yes. trade and uh, maybe be more prosperous? Yes, we, Iran had been. One of, the smart, one, of the, one of the slicker moves of the Obama administration in terms of national, international affairs was we cut off Iran from the international banking system. We have that capability. So you couldn't use a credit card. You couldn't email or wire money in or out of the country. How are you going to do business? Straight barter? Cash on the barrel head? That's what they were forced to go to. No transactions between banks. So if you did business in Iran, you couldn't get paid. Unless you physically ship money out of the country. Paper money. But our abilities there are limited because North Korea currently does a tremendous amount of banking with China. Ah, I'll, 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 I'll skip to that in a minute. I have another question too. Yeah, but hang on a second. I want to... Go ahead. But in terms of Iran, we have an agreement where we're not, going to, we're not going to block that international banking. We may put sanctions on them for ballistic missiles. They may yell names at us and put whatever they want on us. That doesn't violate the agreement as long as we allow commerce and trade to continue with other countries. So Europe's more than happy to have that trade. In fact, Boeing sold them a bunch of airplanes recently. And that's going through. So it, it's an interesting mix that we've got there. Now, you mentioned North Korea. North Korea is doing all its banking through China, through proxies. That's how they hook in the international system. Officially, they're disconnected too. But they have Big Brother. China this week said they're not going to do that. Now. They're not going to do what? They're not going to allow North Korea to use Chinese banks. Okay, they're, they're joining the... Worldwide coalition. If that happens, watch for North Korea to go implode. Now, China says that. Does it mean they're going to do that or just hide it better? Remains to be seen. They have a history of hiding it. There's a lot of uh, freighters going between Russia and North Korea along coastal waters. Now, does that have stuff that's banned? Probably. Can we prove it officially? No. My other but, comment about all of this, maybe I'm using the wrong term, but we seem to be at least somewhat comfortable with Pakistan having nuclear, nuclear weapons. Yeah, I don't know if comfortable really is the right up term. In the but. air about <laughs> North Korea, about Iran, and about whoever else. I don't think we're too keen on either India or Pakistan having nuclear weapons because those two have, all, have, been, have had four wars since independence in the 1940s. Some people think they would have had a couple more if they had not both been nuclear armed because they're afraid of what would happen. <coughs> Much like the Cold War. Yeah, like us and Soviet Union. Exactly. exactly. So maybe it's a good thing. But so far, we feel we have enough influence with the PACs, Pakistani government, 
that uh, it's not worth trying to get them to drop the bomb, to get rid of the bomb. And we're a little naive too. Hmm? Then we are a little bit naive also, aren't we? It just, it's not for a change in you, leadership. Uh, you picked your battles. So far, the Pakistani government has been somewhat helpful. They had somewhat. somewhat. When we went into their country, took out bin Laden and left, did they form an alliance with Russia or China? No. Did they do anything substantive? No. They yelled and screamed at us, and after three, and they arrested a doctor who helped us in the country, and that was it. Mad? Oh yeah, they were mad. But they didn't do anything of substance. They also refused to close the border between right. Afghanistan and Pakistan. All of our supplies go to Afghanistan, come out, go through. 95% of the supplies going into Afghanistan go through Pakistani ports. So they didn't stop that. They stopped, well, they did stop the border for like three days. And then they quietly let it go on. So they've been doing an interesting little shell game where they scream and holler, but they've quietly let us do a lot of things. And they've gotten a lot of aid. They've got a lot of and we've paid them off well. Yeah. <laughs> Which is maybe why they've been so accommodating. So we have, have a mess here. Possible options that I think might work, as much as I dislike and distrust the the current Russian regime, if we could cut a deal with them, we could end this war pretty quickly. And the thing is, that would stop all the... That would stop the refugee, the refugee crisis. crisis worldwide. Yes. Or would it leave Russia trying to handle the whole mess? Well, it would depend on what kind of deal it would be cut. For example, if we were to cut a deal and divide partition Syria into a free Syria and an Assad Syria, and each one claims it owns the other, and you put zones of control, and you have your checkpoint Charlies and things like that. The war ends. But not everybody there likes Russia. Or nope. Their heavy hand. That's right. That's Assad's problem. He would have Russia would have the Assad-ruled area. Another power like Turkey would have the non-Assad-controlled areas. If, if the Kurds are given enough autonomy, they'll play game, they'll play ball with Assad. They are currently. They'll say, okay, let us manage our internal affairs. You can be the Grand Poobah on Damascus and take care of foreign affairs. We don't care. And you still For now. In my view, end up with at least four major powers all after the yeah. natural, all after the natural resources, if you will. Yeah. Iraq looks like it will once again be a country, but the Kurdish question now is popping up. And it's interesting to see how that develops. You know, there, there are areas in the world where the local population is, we're an independent country, and nobody else recognizes them. And no other nation will deal with them as a nation. Have you heard of Somaliland? It's a part of Somalia. It's the northern part of Somalia. When Somalia descended into chaos, a couple of people took over the northern part of the country, along the Horn of Africa, across from Saudi Arabia. We're talking about this area right in here, where Somalia is. And they set up a separate country. They have their own currency, they have their own banking system, they have trade. Nobody recognizes them as a country. Everybody says there's one Somalia, capital down in Mozambique, not up here, it's been the most stable part of that country for 20 years. But they have no representation. That could happen with the Kurds. They could say, we're separate. And everyone goes, no, you're not. They go, yes, we are. They go, no, you're not. And ignore them. And they have their own little de facto state, but none of the, no interactions with other nations, no trade deals, no nothing. It would all have to come through Iraq. My, my own personal bias is it's better to cut a deal and end the war than to go on with thousands of people being killed for political gains and powers trying to get an advantage over one another. To me, that is more the more immoral of the two. 
because I don't know. I don't know what it's like to be a Syrian living in Syria, but I think I'd rather live in peace than being shot at. I suspect most of those folk are the same way. Even if it is a brutal dictator, at least I'm alive and I can have my business or I can go about my life. Questions, okay. comments, observations? Aren't the number of fatalities so, thus far in Syria? Like, Hundreds of thousands. Just un, un, you can't even fathom it. It's yeah. like a, more than we lost in World War II. Yes, more than we lost in World War II. Little country. Yep. In, <laughs> and right now, for what it's worth, over a million Syrians are in here. A couple of billion Syrians, these parts of Turkey. Oh, in the camps. In camps. In, my, in uh, refugee camps. The vast majority of the Syrians did not come, did not leave the area. The vast majority are right there. The EU brokered a deal with Turkey. The EU is helping to pay for the camps. And in return, Turkey is not allowing these people to migrate to Europe. It's forcing them to stay there. At one point, the EU balked about the price and uh, the Turkish government said, fine, we'll just send them on. The EU said, we'll pay. <laughs> so we have almost like 19th century grand power politics. Various nations, each looking for its own advantage. But there's an awful lot of human beings that are getting caught in the crossfire. And that's what bothers me. So my own, my own bias is toward ending the conflict. Others would disagree. Anyone else? Well, thank you for your time and your attention. You. Next week, a conflict that hasn't started yet. But have people been shooting at each other there? Oh, yes. South China Sea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.